So can you tell me where's kind of the latest, uh, the state of the union with, with respect to rapamycin research at the moment? So, so I guess uh, um, I'm not sure that there is a state of the, so well, yeah. I say that um, among the, the broader aging field, uh, I don't think very many people would argue with the idea that rapamycin is sort of the gold standard for drugs, for pharmacological interventions that, that slow aging and increase lifespan in laboratory animals. So rapamycin has been shown by probably more than a dozen labs now, different independent groups, looking at multiple facets of aging in multiple different animal models has been shown to slow aging, increase lifespan, and broadly extend health span over and over and over again, which is sort of unique in the aging field. Almost any other intervention that you point to out there, there's data that um, is contradictory, but everybody agrees rapamycin works. So I think that, that this has led to, to, there are a couple of things that have happened. One is, um, I think scientists, much like other people, have sort of shiny object syndrome. They want to grab onto the next newest great thing. And we know about rapamycin. It works. Everybody knows it works. So it has become not as interesting as, as maybe it should be because of that, right? Because we know it works. Uh, and I also think that there have been, you know, I think you could say legitimate, but maybe overblown concerns about translatability with rapamycin, despite the fact that it's FDA approved and it's been used in humans for decades. Um, it's mostly used uh, at high doses in very sick people. And there are side effects that go along with that, that kind of dosing regimen. And so there are concerns um, that it may be challenging to take rapamycin into the clinic for effects on aging because of sort of the bad reputation it has in the way that it's been used in, in mostly in organ transplant patients. And so that also, I think, has diminished enthusiasm about the clinical translatability of rapamycin. So there is now, I think, a, a fair amount of attention on alternative ways to target mTOR, which is the, the, the protein that rapamycin inhibits, that maybe you could create a version of rapamycin that is has a better side effect profile, but still would give you the, the, the aging benefits. Um, and that remains to be seen. I, I think that you, know, you would probably get different opinions from different people in the field about the likelihood that that strategy is going to be successful. Um, so, that, so there's still a lot of interest in mTOR and rapamycin in the field. Um, uh, and there, as I said, there's interest in, in people developing new drugs that may target that pathway or understanding what are the downstream mechanisms by which rapamycin is working to target those mechanisms directly with the idea being that if you can be more specific in the downstream mechanisms, you might reduce the side effects, which could be caused by you know, quote unquote, off target effects. Um, so for example, we know one of the things that rapamycin does is it turns up this process called autophagy, which is a, a sort of a, a cellular recycling mechanism to break down damaged molecules and recycle them. And so there are a lot of people who think that if you could just turn up autophagy, that would give you some of the benefits, maybe all of the benefits of rapamycin without some of the side effects. So there are people who are trying to target you know, the, the, the mechanisms of rapamycin more specifically to have similar effects. In our clinical studies, the only work that we've really done has been in companion dogs with rapamycin. Yeah. And we have not um, to date seen any evidence for significant side effects of, of any type at the doses that we're using over the mm -hmm. time frame that we've studied. When you look at the side effect um, profile of rapamycin in patients, in human patients, um, it's really important to consider the context. So those are, by and large, people who have had organ transplants. So they're sick people who are taking high doses of rapamycin and, and always taking other drugs, true immunosuppressants. And so it is absolutely the case that in that context, rapamycin is associated with a long list of side effects. When you look at that long list of side effects, by and large, they're not really serious health concerns. So it's not like people are dying from taking rapamycin, but, but these organ transplant patients do have um, uh, several side effects. Um, the, what is the most common side effect are canker sores, so mouth sores, um, unpleasant, but not life-threatening. The side effects that you would be most, I think, concerned about in the context of a healthy aging clinical trial are things like 
like um, impaired glucose homeostasis, high blood lipids, um, and the potential risk for increased risk of infection or delayed wound healing because people think of rapamycin as an immunosuppressant. I think what is emerging is that at the kinds of doses that, that we're thinking about, we sort of talking now globally about the, 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 the portion of the field that is considering rapamycin for clinical use for aging, at those doses that we think are appropriate for aging indications, they're lower than what organ transplant patients would be taking. And it really seems to be the case that it, the drug is not immunosuppressive at those doses. If anything, it's immune boosting. So there have actually been um, two phase two clinical trials with the derivative of rapamycin called Everolimus that showed healthy older people taking that drug for six weeks actually have an improved immune response. So better influenza vaccine response. And then they're also protected against other respiratory tract infections for the next year. So. It's my view that um, the bad reputation of rapamycin among clinicians largely comes from this sick patient population taking high doses where there are real side effects. But at the sort of regimens that, that we're thinking about for healthy aging, the side effects are quite minimal, it seems. Um, the drug is probably very safe. And I think there's good reason to believe that there are probably benefits associated with, with that sort of lower dose uh, uh, rapamycin regimen. Right, because I find, yes, I heard that, that um, it boosts at lower doses, it boosts in the immune system. Um, do you have any idea what the mechanism for, for that is? Because it does seem counterintuitive. Yeah, so it's it's actually interesting. So the, I think the, 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 the honest answer is we don't know, but I think there's there are ideas for what the mechanisms are. And there are, so, so there are several things that rapamycin does that seems to have an impact on the aging process. So if you look at those sort of nine hallmarks of aging that people talk about, uh, that includes things like mitochondrial dysfunction, stem cell senescence, uh, um, uh, uh, telomere shortening, DNA damage. So if you look at those that set of hallmarks of aging, there's evidence that rapamycin affects all of them. Um, and so I think it's safe to say that rapamycin has a lot of downstream effects. Now, which one is most important for the apparent rejuvenation of immune function, um, it, it still remains to be determined. There are, um, there's evidence that induction of, of autophagy is important in this restoration of immune function. There's evidence that um, uh, decreased inflammation, chronic inflammation, which then allows the immune stem cells to function better is important for this uh, uh, improvement in immune function. And then um, work from uh, Joan Mannick's group um, suggest that there's actually a boost in antiviral genes seen upon rapamycin treatment or Everolimus treatment in people. So it's probably a combination of things and exactly how all of these downstream effects of rapamycin are interacting to have effects on the immune system and other aged organs and tissues, I think is a, it's, that's going to be a really important area of research over the next five years or so. Right, thank you. So you did, while we were talking about um, side effects, you did allude to glucose, but I'd like to more yeah. specifically talk about that because, you know, uh, we had Dr. Sabatini here on and he talked about how mTOR2 right. gets over time, chronic rapamycin will, will in inhibit mTOR2. Now, do you see that as a problem with chronic rapamycin yeah, so I think um, so. That's certainly a, a, a plausible model. That so we so let me take a step back. Mm -hmm. The data are clear that chronic rapamycin treatment um, uh, will have an effect on mTORC two. So rapamycin is a specific inhibitor of mTORC one. That's the acute effect with rapamycin. You get inhibition of mTORC one, but then when you have long term inhibition of mTORC one through mechanisms that are still being worked out you can also get inhibition of mTORC2. And the, so that's the data. That much I think everybody agrees on. The model that has been put forth by David Sabatini and Dudley Lamming in particular is that this um, uh, effect on mTORC2 from chronic in, uh, rapamycin treatment is what leads to the, the metabolic um, what they would call dysregulation. So dysregulation of glucose homeostasis and insulin sensitivity um, is associated with this inhibition of mTORC2 and that that's a bad thing. So, so I, I, I think that that model still remains to be tested. So it is the case that if you genetically inhibit mTORC2, you do get these effects on glucose homeostasis that are associated with rapamycin treatment. 
whether that is actually a negative effect of rapamycin treatment, I think is where we really don't know the answer. So it is quite possible that those of the effects of rapamycin on glucose metabolism and, and other um, uh, types of metabolism, so other potential carbon sources that can be used uh, to create energy like ketone bodies or fats, right? We know rapamycin has these global effects on metabolism, whether those are a negative consequence or might actually be important for the, the effects of rapamycin on healthy longevity, I think remains to be determined. And so, you know, as an example of a potential positive effect of mTORC2 inhibition by rapamycin, we recently published that in a mouse model of mitochondrial disease, so, so mitochondrial dysfunction, inhibition of mTORC2 by chronic high-dose rapamycin is actually part of the rescue mechanism. So it's actually beneficial in the context of severe mitochondrial dysfunction. That doesn't mean it's beneficial in the context of normal aging, but I think it's a hypothesis that needs to be tested and nobody has actually tested it yet. So it's sort of become dogma a little bit in the field that, that, that inhibition of mTORC1 is good and inhibition of mTORC2 is bad. I think that model still needs to be tested a little bit more before we really know, you know what the important positive and potentially negative effects of rapamycin are and what the mechanisms are. Okay, excellent. That's really interesting. Um, so we've been talking about dosing, right? Um, and, but we haven't been specific. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and I understand that, you know, translating between species is not easy, but could you talk about the dosing and the timing of um, the rapamycin that you have given and plan to give to the, to the dogs? Sure. So, uh, so we've tested um, three doses of rapamycin in dogs so far. So this is all oral tablets. So the same generic rapamycin, which is called serolimus or rapamune that um, patients, human patients would take. Uh, the doses that we've tested in dogs have been given three times a week. The highest dose is 0.1 uh, milligrams per kilogram. So we always dose based on body weight. Uh, we tested an intermediate dose of 0.05 milligrams per kilogram, and then the low dose of 0.025 milligrams per kilogram. So a fourfold range. Um, at none of those doses have we seen any significant side effects. So we've done a 10-week study at the two higher doses, uh, and then a six-month study at the 0.025 milligrams per kilogram, again, three times a week. Um, the only... Uh, the only side effect that we're pretty confident was due to the rapamycin was we had one dog in the six month study that had elevated triglycerides and we'll have a paper coming out, a case report on that dog soon. No detrimental effects associated with that, but, but that is a, a side effect that is seen in some people. Uh, and we did have one dog that showed that, that side effect. So um, other than that, we've had no real concerns with any of the doses that, that we've tested. Um, and so I think this also points to another um, consideration when you think about the side effects of rapamycin. So I alluded to the mouth sores earlier, which are the most common side effect in, in humans taking rapamycin. That really seems to be in some ways um, very individual specific. So some people get them, some people don't. It also seems to be to some extent dose uh, independent. So the people, People who will get them will sometimes get them at low doses, sometimes get them at high doses. The people that aren't going to get the mouse sores don't get them at the high doses or the low doses. So it makes us wonder if the same thing might be true in dogs. Maybe there's a genetic predisposition, you know, to, to some of these potential side effects from rapamycin. But I also, when, whenever I talk about side effects, I really want to make the point that any intervention that we think about in the context of aging or in general, right, any drug, any dietary intervention, any intervention has side effects. So there is always a risk reward ratio to be considered with anything that you do. That's true of exercise, right? I like to make this point because we, we know exercise is great for us, right? It, it, it has lots of health benefits, but to anybody who exercises regularly, there are a lot of side effects associated with exercise too. I've got muscle pain quite often from different types of exercise, but we don't think about it as side effects because we, you know, we think about things like different diets and exercise as natural. Um, and so we just don't think about them the same way. So I really think it's important mm. when, we're, when we're trying to, you know, consider the relative risk reward profile of different interventions that we, we, we try to 
we try to consider these things, um, you know, somewhat equally, right? That, that there are side effects associated with rapamycin, just like there are with any drug. It's dependent on dose. Um, and again, in my opinion, at the doses that we're thinking about for healthy aging, the risk is pretty low. The side effect risk is pretty low for rapamycin. And, and I think that, um, you know, again, in my view, that it's, it's an acceptable risk for the potential reward. Right. So one, one last question on rapamycin. Um, have you, you know, have we given rapamycin and then seen that the effect continues even after the rapamycin kind of dosage has stopped? And, and how long does that last? Do we have any idea? Yeah, so this is a really interesting and important um, area of, of research that is, that is pretty active. So absolutely in mice, it is now clear that um, short-term, you know, we're talking on the order of, of six to 12 weeks, short-term treatments with rapamycin can reverse certain aspects of aging and that those effects seem to persist, you know, for at least, you know, eight to 12 weeks. So nobody has really, has really looked you know, quantitatively long-term at persistence of effects, but for uh, rejuvenation of heart function, um, there's now data that that eight weeks of treatment is enough to take an old heart and at least for left ventricular function, make it work like a young heart. And those effects seem to persist at least for another eight weeks after the treatment stops. Um, we have unpublished data now for, for, for uh, reversal of periodontal disease, very similar kind of persistence of effects. And then I alluded to the clinical trials for uh, immune function in healthy older people. So there, what they showed was that six weeks of, a, of everolimus treatment, this derivative of rapamycin, was enough to boost a flu vaccine response. But then those same people who got that six week, week treatment over the next year got fewer upper respiratory tract infections. So again, it looks like there was some sort of functional persistence of whatever rapamycin or everolimus in this case did to the immune system that effect was enough to confer some protection over the next year. So functionally, yes, it seems to be the case that there is at least some persistence of these, these rejuvenative effects of rapamycin. Mechanistically, how that's working, I think, is largely um, not understood and you know, a really important uh, area for future research. If I had to guess, I think it's at least partially due to the uh, pretty dramatic effects that rapamycin has on, on tamping down age-related inflammation. And that's at least in part due to shutting off the inflammatory signals of senescent cells, or at least P16 positive cells that are giving off these inflammatory signals. Excellent. Thank you. That, that sounds hopeful. Um, thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.